Did you know that anesthesia providers still don't exactly know how anesthesia gases actually work? While modern science has revealed a few mechanisms of action for inhaled anesthetics, we still haven't come to a complete conclusion on how these drugs work at the molecular level to keep you asleep during surgery. In this video, we cover a fascinating topic that is still puzzling clinicians and scientists the mechanisms of action of inhaled anesthetics. Before we dive in, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe so you're always the first to find out about our latest anesthesia and science videos. And if you haven't checked it out already, we also have a great podcast, the Atomic Anesthesia Podcast, that you can listen to on the go. Inhaled anesthetics are a class of powerful drugs that induce unconsciousness and prevent pain during surgical procedures by altering neuronal activity in the brain and the spinal cord. These volatile compounds such as sevoflurane, desflurane, and nitrous oxide are administered as gases or vapors through the respiratory system, allowing for precise control of anesthetic depth and rapid adjustment during surgery. For a more complete introduction to inhaled anesthetics and general anesthesia, check out the links to our other videos in the description. Let's start by discussing what inhaled anesthetics do. So they have about four main effects. Sedation or unconsciousness, also called hypnosis, amnesia, immobility, and analgesia. These effects are achieved by acting on various parts of the central nervous system. In the brain, inhaled anesthetics affect the amygdala and the hippocampus to disrupt memory formation and cause amnesia. They also act in the cortex to alter consciousness and on the reticular formation and the thalamus to affect wakefulness. In the spinal cord, these drugs produce immobility. The brainstem is also involved, particularly the periaqueductal gray matter, which modulates pain through descending pathways, contributing to analgesic effects of inhaled anesthetics. Speaking of immobility, it's interesting to note that this effect is principally produced in the spinal cord rather than in higher brain centers. The ability of inhaled anesthetics to cause immobility doesn't correlate with EEG activity, which reflects that cortical electrical activity doesn't control the motor responses to noxious stimuli. Instead, these drugs suppress motor neuron excitability and nociceptive transmission in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They do this by affecting glycine and glutamate receptors, as well as voltage-gated sodium channels and potassium channels. Now, let's talk about some of the older theories about how these drugs work. One of the most well-known is the Meyer-Overton rule, which states that the potency of a general anesthetic is directly proportional to its lipid solubility. In other words, the more soluble an agent is, the greater its potency, which is indicated by a lower MAC value. This theory suggests that anesthetics act by interacting with the lipid components of neuronal membranes, altering the lipid environment of proteins and changing their function. However, the Meyer-Overton rule has limitations. It doesn't explain why some high lipid solubility compounds fail to induce anesthesia. This is also known as the cutoff effect or why anesthetics can interact with proteins independently of these lipids. These exceptions indicate that other molecular targets, such as ion channels or proteins, also play a role in anesthetic action. Several alternative theories have challenged the Meyer-Overton rule. The protein targets theory suggests that anesthetics can interact directly with proteins, like ion channels and enzymes, rather than solely with lipid membranes. Stereoselectivity, or the differential potency of anesthetic enantiomers, indicate that specific protein binding sites are critical for anesthetic action. The existence of non-immobilizers, or compounds with high lipid solubility but no anesthetic effect, suggests that different molecular targets mediate distinct components of anesthesia, such as amnesia versus immobility. For example, parafluoropentane can produce amnesia but not immobility to noxious stimuli, suggesting separate sites and mechanisms of anesthetic action for some drugs. Despite all this research, we still don't completely understand the mechanism of action of inhaled anesthetics. The common hypothesis today is that general anesthesia results from direct and indirect interactions with multiple and diverse receptors and ion channels in the central nervous system. The main targets are neurotransmitter-gated ion channels and two poor potassium channels. 
with voltage gated ion channels potentially playing a role as well. Most studies show that no single receptor explains all of the actions of general anesthetics. It's important to note that the multiple components of the anesthetic state, amnesia, unconsciousness, analgesia, and immobility are mediated by different receptors and neural pathways. This complexity is further highlighted by the fact that there's no common chemical structure for the variety of compounds capable of producing anesthesia. Let's dive a little deeper into the protein targets theory, which suggests that inhaled anesthetics interact with specific proteins rather than just lipids. One way these drugs work is by enhancing inhibitory neurotransmitter. They do this by acting on GABA-A receptors, prolonging chloride ion influx, which leads to hyperpolarization and reduced neuronal excitability. This happens because chloride ions are negatively charged. So when the GABA-A receptor, which is a chloride ion channel, opens, chloride floods the cell, making it more negatively charged. When a cell becomes more negatively charged, it's more difficult for that neuron to fire an action potential. Glycine receptors, major mediators of inhibitory neurotransmission in the spinal cord, may also play a role in immobility produced by inhaled anesthetics. In fact, intravenous and intrathecal administration of glycine receptor antagonists, or blockers, increase the MAC or the minimal alveolar concentration of inhaled anesthetics. Another important target is potassium channels, particularly two poor domain potassium channels. These intrinsic membrane receptors or ion channels normally act to maintain the cell's resting potential and respond to internal stimuli such as changes in pH. Several members of this family, including TREK and TASC channels, have been found to be sensitive to volatile anesthetics. These channels increase leak conductance, hyperpolarizing neurons and reducing action potential generation. This happens because potassium ions are positively charged and when potassium channels open and potassium leaks out of the cell, the cell becomes more negatively charged, making it more difficult to fire an action potential. Inhaled anesthetics also work by suppressing excitatory neurotransmission, reducing neuronal excitability. They affect glutamate receptors, including both G-protein coupled receptors and ligand gated receptors. MDA receptors, for example, are suppressed by these drugs, blocking glutamate activity, particularly with agents like nitrous oxide. AMPA and kinate receptors are also affected. These drugs also influence the release of neurotransmitters from presynaptic neurons. They inhibit nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, decreasing excitatory presynaptic activity and reducing neurotransmitter release. Voltage-gated sodium channels are also another target, with different subtypes being affected to varying degrees. Sodium channels that mediate action potentials along the axon of the neurons are not significantly affected, while those that modulate the release of neurotransmitters may be more sensitive to anesthetics. This particularly affects neurons that release glutamate. Several recent studies do support that anesthetics affect membrane proteins embedded in lipids, disrupting their function through changes in protein-lipid interactions rather than bulk lipid properties. This lipid-protein interaction theory suggests that anesthetics may alter the lipid environment surrounding membrane proteins, indirectly affecting their protein function. This includes disruption of lipid rafts and activation of pathways like TREK1 potassium channels. There's also evidence that inhaled anesthetics can directly bind to G-protein coupled receptors influencing downstream signaling pathways that are critical for CNS function. At a network level, anesthetics disrupt neuronal connectivity by altering synaptic transmission and oscillations in key brain regions, like the thalamus and the cortex, impairing consciousness and memory formation. Despite these advances in our understanding, the exact mechanisms of inhaled anesthetics remains complex and multifactorial. Current research emphasizes precise molecular interactions with proteins over simple lipid solubility models, but there's still so much to learn about these fascinating drugs. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel for more in-depth content on anesthesia and related topics. Don't forget to check out our free resources on atomicanesthesia.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.